Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Dream Big Today, formerly Elizabeth Sharon Ann. You know what? We've, we've been just kind of reminding you every day that we're changing the name. And so I welcome you to Monday morning, Magnificent Monday. And let's see, this is August the 8th. And so, man, school's right around the corner. There's, you know, maybe, maybe you have kiddos that's already starting, but I think uh, we've got about two more weeks here in Oklahoma before some of them do. So uh, if you would like this page, go on to YouTube and like it and subscribe. We love to hear your comments. And if you could just put your prayer request in the chat box, or you know what's even wonderful is your uh, your praise reports because you know God's answering prayers all the time. Sometimes He answers a prayer that you didn't pray because He knows what's best for you, and those are the really cool ones when you think, "Oh, is that a coincidence?" No, that's not a coincidence. That's a God directed movement. And you got to experience that. So, so put that in there too. Um, let me see. Let me run down my list and see whatever else I have to say to you this morning. Because, you know, I'm a little tired. I think maybe, maybe you recall from last week. Good morning, Donna. Uh, last week, we had, I had a guest in my house. I had my little five-year-old grandson. And, you know... When you haven't been in in total care of a five year old in a while, you kind of I, I kind of think of this as like a rubber band. You know, my rubber band hadn't been stretched at all, so I you know I can FaceTime him, I can go visit him, go there, come back. I you know, anyway, when I'm in charge twenty four seven. I start getting my, my rubber band starts being pulled out. And you know what? I have no kinks or anything in my body today because we worked all those out. Funny things that happened. We had Bible school. And so I helped, I volunteered because I had him. So that was two days. We had two days at the library in reading time. We had one day in a play pit. We rode our bike, we colored, we played cards and we played dominoes. He's smart. He can learn how to play all this. I, I gave him a haircut the whole time he was giggling. Now, it's not straight. And there's some places that, that the hair is shorter than the other, especially in the back. He can't see it. His mom says it's okay. It'll grow out. We, I, re, I, I was reminded that just say, simply saying the word poop will bring giggles out. And any bodily noises will bring giggles out. Um, let's see. Oh, one of the, oh, he got up one morning and walked in the living room and he said, I smell fruits and vegetables. Well, he, he's, he's sharp. And I said, well, I'm not making fruits and vegetables right now. You're smelling a candle. So that was a relief for him. We, I was reminded of Star Wars and Stormtroopers because everywhere he, we went, he was doing that, that shooting sound that the Stormtroopers did. But the best thing of all was Bible school. And the song that they sang over and over and over was, I have decided to follow Jesus. And you know, these kiddos are sharp. They pick up way faster than we do. We never know when they're listening and they're listening. After we left there, we went to Walmart to pick up things. In fact, I think we went to a store every day. But I mean, he just starts singing I have decided to follow Jesus in his little five-year-old squeaky voice. It was the cutest thing. And I thought, I'm just going to drive this cart all over Walmart. And just let everybody hear my little guy sing. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. It was awesome. And so, you know, if, if there's just times that it's just nice to put like something different in your life as you're going along and, and just stay focused, stay, stay focused in the word. We had some other things happen that, that was challenging, but you know what? God knew how this week was going to turn out and it, it worked out beautiful. It worked out beautiful. So, and oh, and one more thing, one more thing. When you never, when you 
don't know what to do sometimes you get this word of encouragement from somebody and as i was leaving bible school on the last day one couple i'd been talking to about you know i you know I, i'm chasing my little guy all the time and you know so i, I kind of talked about some other things that had been going on but as i was getting ready to leave he, he this young man turned around and looked at me as i'm getting ready to walk out the door and he said I believe in you. That's all he said. And you know what? That stuff, as simple as those words were, I believe in you, changed my perspective of the week because I'm in the word and he knows I'm in the word. And we can let that enemy start creeping up on our shoulder and saying, you, you can't do this. But whenever somebody says, I believe in you, then you know, okay, let's just kick off the, all this junk and stay focused and just enjoy life as God has given it to you. So there we go. That my, my beginning commentary for this morning. Now then, let's get into the Bible reading because this is really good today. Um, we're in Ezra 7, 1 through 8, 20, and this, we just, we're getting introduced to Ezra. I mean, here we are seven chapters later in the book of Ezra, and we finally get to talk about Ezra. And so it, this starts out by giving the genealogy of Ezra. He's an important man. Uh, and then we get on down to verse six, and it says, this Ezra was a scribe who was well versed in the law of Moses, which the Lord, the God of Israel, has given to the people of Israel. He came up to Jerusalem from Babylon, and the king gave him everything he asked for because the gracious hand of the Lord was on him. Now, I want to stop for a second. Now, he was a scribe. Scribes were important in those days. They had influence, they had, and they had duties of preserving the word of God. They taught the word of God, and they interpreted and applied the word of God. So Ezra was really a smart man. He, he loved what he did. So there's a number of men in scripture who God blessed. He blessed Abraham, Jacob, Joseph, David. And they're just prominent examples. But with Ezra, you know, he's not, he's just not right up there at the top of the list for some reason. But he's also a man who God blessed. Now, God raised up Ezra and Nehemiah, which we will soon be reading Nehemiah, to bring spiritual reform to his people. I'm thinking that would be pretty cool if you were selected to be that. And, and you know, we are today. We are selected to, to be apostles, missionaries to everybody that is around us. Oh, I've got my, my lights are shining in my eyes. And, but God raised them up for this. He's raised you up for the same thing. Now, both of these men were born in Babylon and had close connections with the king, Artaxerxes. And you know what? There's, there's probably a way better way to say that. But for this, I'm just call, calling him Art. So King Art, they left comfortable living. They were in Babylon. They had everything they needed. Good morning, D. That's why I see a name pop up. They left that to endure hardships because you know what? Whenever you're doing things for the Lord, you, you've left everything that you've, you've accumulated because stuff doesn't matter. We'll soon be talking about how you look doesn't matter. Um, so there's a phrase that's going to occur three times in this scripture. Then another total of five times throughout the rest of it and Nehemiah. And it is, if you'll notice in verse, uh, 
Ezra, Ezra 7 verse 6, it says, for the hand of the Lord, his God was on him. You know what? I'm thinking that that's just, that's a whole, that's a whole morning of discussion and, and talking about that. Because why was the hand of God upon him? Ezra 7.10 tells us, if you look at 7.10, it says this was because Ezra had determined to study and obey the law of the Lord and to teach those decrees and regulations to the people of Israel. So that's, folks, that's like us. We're determined to study the word each and every day. We want to, we want it to just soak into our hearts, our minds, our soul. So when we have those tough times that come along, that, that we can draw from what we have learned, what we have studied, what the Holy Spirit has brought up from our soul to remind us about our God. So it said, it says that uh, the gracious hand was on him again, like in verse nine. And then in uh, verse, well, I wrote them out. Verse 28, it says it was on him. And in 8, 18, it says it was on him. And that's just in the sections that we're reading today. So this is this was a blessing. God's blessings comes to those who study and obey his word. Because you know what? If you weren't into this and studying it, you would think that that great thing that happened to you was my lucky day. My lucky day. Well, there's no such thing as luck. You may think so, but once you start studying the Bible, you start realizing that that. God is in control of everything, and God doesn't work with luck. It's intentional. So all of us should be seeking God's blessing. Uh, now, I've got, I've got to flip into my other Bible. Ah, uh, and too bad I didn't have that opened up to that page, so you wouldn't have to wait for me. But you know what? It's really, really close, because there was a section I wanted to read to you. Now, verse 10 in the New King James is, is I like that, that. I like that version. It said, for Ezra had prepared his heart to seek the law of the Lord and to do it and to teach statutes and ordinances in Israel. So how did he prepare his heart? How do you prepare your heart whenever you're getting ready to study? Do you, do you just stop, silence everything, and you just pray that the Holy Spirit will open your mind, heart, and soul so you'll be able to receive the word, and it will, it will be planted in you just like that seed that grows, and you water it every day that you get into the word. You're seeking it. You, you, you. Focus on every word. You read it. You reread it. And you read it again. You talk about it with your friends. Instead of talking about every all of the ugly things that's going on, talk about what you your nuggets that you got out of the word today. And then do it. It says do it. We, you know, we're not just doing this on just so everybody will say, oh, I saw that everybody was on Bible study this morning. Well, what if Bible study didn't last all day long and you had to get up, leave your office, your comfortable chair, and you had to go see somebody in the hospital? What if you had to go uh, counsel somebody that was, that was uh, you know, not in the best mindset? They were having a bad day. They were, they were a difficult person. Well, see, we, we, we study this, so we are able to shine God's light onto somebody. And sometimes you don't have to say a whole lot. Maybe you just shine his light and let them feel the presence of God through you. We're not God, but we can show the presence of God. So Bible study. Now, God provided Ezra favor. And that's the great thing about 
being in prayer. I tell you, all of my career, whenever I was working, I had favor. There was times that maybe he had to correct me to pull me back on the right path. But whenever I was in tune all the time, I would see these little, these little nuggets that would just drop on me. And, you know, I'd say, oh, thank you, Jesus. And it could be just as simple as, as driving to work one morning and thinking, oh, how am I ever going to get through this day? And I just, you know, be praying. And then this car passes by me and its tag was simply amen. And I thought, wow, wow, God, that was, that was right there. That was wonderful. So see, here's Ezra. And he has the favor of King Art. And it tells us in verse 11 that the king gave him a copy of the following letter to Ezra, the scribe who studied and taught the commands. And so he's, and he's addressing it from the king of kings, king of kings, and, and see how he says that. And he referred to himself as king of kings because he was the most powerful man in the world. Now, the next time we see king of kings, that's going to be our savior. And we won't be just seeing a, you know, somebody on this earth doing that. We're going to see him. Um, and then he caught, he says to the, the teacher of law of, of the God of heaven greetings. And so then he makes these declarations. And this is pretty cool because Ezra has favor and the king has, has been specific on what, you know, about the funds, the finances, help. He's talking about the donations are to be used for the purchase of these items uh, and down to everything. I mean, he's got like the gifts that everybody is to bring. There's to bring, uh, you get or give him up to 7,500 pounds of silver, 500 bushels of heat, of wheat, 550 gallons of wine, <coughs> excuse me, 550 gallons of olive oil. Uh, and then it says in 23, be careful to provide whatever the God of heaven demands for his, his temple. For why should we risk bringing God's anger against the realm of the king and his sons? So Ezra had favor. He gave him favor in and authority in civil matters. He gave him authority to teach to the returned exiles. Ezra got permission to bring people back. Why is that? Well, he had this letter, so it was like a passport. So nobody would get in trouble for going from one place to the other. And Ezra's, pretty much Ezra's thanks or his doxology starts in verse 27 of chapter seven. He says, praise the Lord, the God of our ancestors who made the king want to beautify the temple of the Lord in Jerusalem. And praise him for demonstrating such unfailing love to me by honoring me before the king, his council, and all his mighty nobles. I, I felt encouraged because the gracious hand of the Lord, my God, was on me. That, I mean, sums it all up. Oh, yes, uh, somebody says, and I don't know who that is, but King Art was Queen Esther's stepson. I, I had that mentioned or written down in my notes, and I forgot to say that. Thank you. But he was, he had favor, and the king helped him. And so God moved the heart of King Art. Proverbs 21 1 is a good one for this. The king's heart is in the hand of the Lord, like the rivers of water. He turns it wherever he wishes. In, in chapter eight, it just goes on down to the genealogies of the people that came forward. 
And once again, in verse 18, we see, since the gracious hand of our God was on us, they sent a man named Sherebiah, along with 18 sons and, and brothers. He was a very astute man and descendant of Mali, who was a descendant of Levi, the son of Israel. Okay, so the awesome thing about that is uh, Sherebiah means singing with the Lord, or in another place, it's, all, it's also interpreted as flame of the Lord. This is the guy they picked out. Isn't that uh, just wonderful, wonderful stuff. And so the very, very last line or the very last verse, um, the temple servants were assistants to the Levites, a group of temple workers first instituted by King David and his officials. They were all listed by name. He knows your name. You are not just a somebody. You're not a nobody. You are listed by name. He's got you. And you know what? None of us, none of us can hide. I just think that's pretty cool. I can't wait to hear what my name sounds like whenever they call it out someday. Okay, so let's jump on into 1 Corinthians 4, 1 through 21. Let me get, get, my, get my stuff all shifted around here. This is, this is wonderful. Also, because Paul is just a little bit sarcastic, a little bit of holy sarcasm. Is there such a thing as that? Maybe, maybe I shouldn't have said that, but he is uh, speaking to the Corinthians and it's, it's scolding. There's a little bit of scolding for the church in Corinthians. Uh, it starts out as, so look at Apollos and me, Paul, as mere servants of Christ who have been put in charge of explaining God's mysteries. Now, a person who is put in charge as a manager must be faithful. Wow, how faithful are we? You know, we can, we can just feel good and want to do all kinds of stuff when we feel good when we're when we're not hungry we don't have that hangry moment or it's convenient what if what if stuff happens and it's not convenient let me let me tell you i know what that's like faithfulness was important y'all they they had to be in efficient managers of the master's resources and that's us today how efficient are you in managing the master's resources? As we read this, I want you just to keep a little thought in the back of your mind. He's going to talk about life as a stewardship. Be faithful. Life is a gift. Be humble. Life is a battle. Be courageous. You know, he's with you everywhere in battles. Life is a school. Be teachable. So in verse three, Paul says, as for me, it matters very little how I might be evaluated by you or any other human authority. See, he didn't care what they thought about him. He was, he looked dirty. He was poor. His, he probably had raggedy clothes on. Maybe he had, maybe his sandals were broken. Maybe they didn't match. Heaven forbid, if, if, you're, if your stuff doesn't match. Um, but he says, I don't even trust my own judgment on this point. My conscience is clear, but that doesn't prove I'm right. It's the Lord himself who will examine me and decide. So we can be our own worst critic. And the estimation of ourself is generally wrong because you know, I, I would have never thought that I would be sitting in here talking to you all today because that's just that, you know, that just kind of like, I can't teach. I don't know anything about this. But you know what? Whenever you submit and and just just follow God's will, then great things happen. We can be too hard or too easy on ourselves. And Paul recognizes this. In verse five, it says, so don't make judgments about anyone ahead of time before the Lord returns. 
for he will bring our darkest secrets to light and will reveal our private motives. Then God will give to each whatever praise is due. See, we're not supposed to judge others. You can consider yourself better, but that's arrogant, right? So don't judge people on their appearance. Don't even judge them on their actions of one particular day because, again, they may, they may be having a bad day. You know, I think of judging as like watching my granddaughter play basketball. And boy, those refs don't always make the right call because I know what they should call. And she didn't foul or she didn't walk or somebody else must have tipped that ball out of her hand that went out of bounds. It, it couldn't have been her fault. See, I could judge him all day long, but he's he is he is on the court and he is in a different angle than I am. And I'm a spectator. I'm not, I'm not, I, I paid to come watch. I didn't pay to be the judge. I didn't, I'm not getting paid to be the ref from the stands in my little cushy seat that I carry around. So we just have to be careful about that. But, you know, we still want to coach and we have to do all of that in love. And, and I say coach because we, it's, it's hard to get the, the term judge in in the right category don't be hypocritical when you do it don't judge by appearance nor judge by what i think that they should do just like you know everybody has their own path to walk god has going to get them there and they may zigzag that path instead of walking the straight line but the whole at the end of the day it's where do they end up at in verse six, it says, dear brothers and sisters, I have used Apollos and myself to illustrate what I've been saying. If you pay attention to what I quoted from the scriptures, you won't be proud of one of your leader of your leaders and at the expense of another. So, wow, are you attracted to the spiritual leaders because they are entertaining or because they are preaching the word? Do you like your church because of the wonderful music? Do you like the beat of the music? Do you like the sound of the music? Are you listening to the words? Are the words edifying? Are they encouraging? Is the pastor preaching out of the Bible? Are you listening for the word of God? You know, we don't, we don't judge a church on the entertainment value because it's, that's not what it is. We are there to fellowship be with like-minded people and and praise god and listen and then you go home and you take the notes that you made and you, for mine i went to two churches sunday my husband was gone so i went to our church and then i was able to buzz from that to my daughter's church and so i had two sets of notes sunday and it was awesome because i got so many different things um, and then, oh, here's another one that I wanted to read out of my other Bible. Let me get that. Verse six. Let me let me get my let me pull this back up again. I, this is this may be a three hour Bible study. I'm kidding, but I'd sure like for it to be. OK, in verse six, I'm going to read this out of the New King James version. Oh, and thank you. Preach it, sister. I love it. Ann. love you, too. Um, in verse six, it says, now these things, brethren, I have figuratively transferred myself and Apollos for your sakes that you may learn in us not to think beyond what is written, that none of you may be puffed up on behalf of one against the other. Okay, so what does that mean? Don't read into more than what you're reading. Now, you need, there's revelation in the word and you want to study the word, but don't start telling people what they should or shouldn't do, assuming that it is in the Bible because you think it's right. You know, we, we have the, the saying that uh, cleanliness is next to godliness. Well, you know what? That's not in the Bible. Now, Leviticus talks about being clean and and processes for that but 
there's nowhere in there that says that. So see, we can get this little cute saying that sounds real uh, spiritual and we can use that as a word. Well, it's not. So don't pull and try to make up something because you think it's right. Go by the word. Don't cherry pick the Bible. Then look at verse seven. For what gives you the right to make such a judgment? Here's three questions, three great questions. And what do you have that God hasn't given you? See, we, he's given us gifts. You, didn't, you don't have a gift because you developed it yourself. You have a gift because God gave you the ability. And if you will practice that and exercise that ability, you will ref refine it and it will get better and better every day. Just like reading the Bible, your understanding of the Bible will get better and better every day the more you read it. If I play the piano, because I took piano lessons, I will get better and better. I haven't, I haven't played the piano in a long time. I can still pick out some songs, but I'm not very, I'm not good. If I would practice, then I could be good. It's a gift. And the third question, and, and if everything you have is from God, why do you boast as though it were not a gift? Okay, so you're not, you're not self-made. We hear people say, I'm a self-made millionaire. Well, you know, nobody in my area, but anyway, if you're not self-made in anything, God gave you the ability. He gave you the, the, the knowledge, the wisdom, the skills to be able to do what you're doing. You're not self-made. If everything is a gift from God, everything I have is a gift from God. Now, did he expect me to buy all of this junk with the funds that he, he provided? Probably not. But you know what? He, did, he didn't condemn me for it either. All of my little junk here and there is, you know, a gift from somebody or something I picked up that I thought was cute. But everything is a gift. And then he's still sarcastic with the Corinthians. You think you already have everything you need. Man, wouldn't that be awesome to say that? You think you're already rich. You have begun to reign in God's kingdom without us. I wish you were really reigning already for then we would be reigning with you. Instead, I sometimes think God has put us apostles on display like prisoners of war at the end of the victor's parade. See, at the, at, in those days, whenever they would come back from a war, the prisoners was drugged or led by the very back horses in through town so everybody could see them walking in and they were dirty they were probably bloody beaten and 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 just you know sad to see um but then people saw them because as they walked near and near to their final destination that meant death so paul is saying that we are on display like prisoners of war at the end of the victor's parade we have become a spectacle for the entire world to, to people and angels alike. Now, becoming a spectacle speaks of how the apostles were publicly humiliated. Now, that kind of humility was a horror to the pride of the Corinthian Christians. See, pride was a big deal with all of that. They, they were full of it. There was no room for any kindness because they were all, they, you know, they had their filled ourselves up with pride. And so he goes on to talk about, even though we're hungry and thirsty, and, and one word that, I, I, that is not in my normal vocabulary, and it will be in New King James, verse 13, and I'm going to read that. Uh, being defamed, we entreat. We have been made as the filth of the world, the offscoring, offscouring, of all things until now. Offscouring. Offscouring of all things. Some ancient Greeks had a custom of casting certain worthless people into the sea during a time of plague or famine. While saying, be our offscouring. The victims were called scrapings. 
in the belief that they would wipe away the community's guilt. Now, can you just imagine, we've gone through this, this crazy plague in the last couple of years. What if this was still the case? What if everybody that had COVID was scooped up, taken out to sea and just dumped in the ocean? See, that's what they did. They, they, they dropped them in the sea. What a, what a sad time to live. You know, we think that, this, that we're living in the last days. We are living in the last days. But we think, oh, how could ever, anything ever get any worse than it is right now? Well, let me tell you. How many times did you ever see anybody just taken out to sea in a big ship and just dumped it? You know, it wasn't a shipwreck. It was intentional doing away with human life. And I'm looking at my clock, y'all, and it is after nine, and I am so sorry. I still, you know, with, with looking at Corinthians, it, there's, Paul is really writing deep, and we have to remember when we're reading this to, to get, get Jesus out of it. We're, we're not studying Paul necessarily. We're studying what Paul says about Jesus and what Jesus wants us to do. He's talking about in verse 14, and I'm going to say this really quick. He's taking the role of, you know, a father, a father figure. And this is something that, that our, our dads need to, to, to see. He's telling them to, uh, to imitate him. He says, for I became your father in Christ Jesus when I preached the good news to you. I urge you to imitate me. He wants them to know his purpose hasn't been to make them feel ashamed or warn them of a significant spiritual danger, which is pride. So although we read some sarcasm in his, in his tone, he's, he's wrapping this up. And uh, like one lady once said a lot, he circled around. And he's, he's telling them, this is what you need to do. Imitate Paul, who, who was regarded as a fool, as a weak and dishonored, hungry, thirsty, poorly clothed. People saw his faith and the off-scouring of all things. Imitate Paul. People had to learn the gospel by watching his life. See, they didn't get that he, he wasn't able to hand out little New Testaments or, or anything like we can do right now. He, they had to see him. That's what we need to do today. We need to, for those people that don't want a Bible, don't have a Bible, let them see the joy in your heart. Let them see the the New Testament in you. Let them see Corinthians in you, Galatians, Ephesians, and all of that. Um, and then just, let's see, let me go, let me buzz on down since I'm already late. In verse 18, some of you have become arrogant, thinking I will not visit you, but I will come. And soon, if the Lord lets me, and then I'll find out whether these arrogant people just give pretentious speeches or whether they have God really have God's power. The kingdom of God and living out our faith is not just fancy spiritual talk, folks. We got to practice it. You know, things happen to us that we don't like. And, and somebody might say something to us that's not nice and it's not uplifting, certainly. You know, it could all, almost be like... Uh, like a, a heated argument, uh, but just let that be on their side. Watch what you say, because you don't have control of that person. You only have control of yourself. So we have to practice what we, what we preach. Paul is practicing what he preaches and what he teaches, and he's living by God's power. You see, at the end of that verse, it says whether they really have God's power. We live, we want to live, we need to live by God's power. And then verse 20, for the kingdom of God is not just a lot of talk, it is living by God's power. Paul gives him a choice on down in verse 21. What do you choose? Should I come with a rod to punish you or should I come with love and gentle spirit? 
they would either see Paul with that rod or with that spirit. And you know what? Discipline, boundaries is important no matter what. My little guy last week found out what Proverbs 13, 24 was. It says, spare the rod and spoil the child. And he found out that if he back talked his grandma, that, that he might get a surprise hand on his backside. You know, you don't, you don't beat anybody, but you can get you a SWAT is no big deal, but it got his attention. And he loved me as you know, whenever, whenever you were doing the, the discipline, no matter what it is, if I, if I am talking to whoever and, you know, I, I am talking to them in love, I'm still wrapping love around them. Just like my little guy in a different manner. I wrapped love around him whenever I had him with me. And so he always came up to me at the end of it and said, I love you. And you know what? That's the most important word to hear from a five-year-old is that I love you, Mimi. So I'm going to let you go today. It's, it's been great. Psalms 30, please read that because you know what? Verse 11 says, you've turned my morning into joyful dancing. And I think today is the day for you to turn on that Christian music, that beautiful song that you just love to hear and you play it over and over in your car, turn it on in your living room and start your joyful dancing. David did. Throw off all those clothes of mourning. Throw off all those clothes of, of uh, that, that, that you've just been carrying along. Put your clothes of joy on that I may sing praises to you and not be silent. Oh, Lord, my God, I give you thanks forever. I give you thanks forever. Dance today. Sing to, sing to Jesus. He loves it. And you know what? My little fella saying, I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. It's a great Monday. Go, go shine your light that Jesus gave you to shine to somebody. And I will see you later. Have a great Monday. Love y'all. Bye-bye. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Dream.